Meet Rahim Gauss. He's the frontline defender of Malaysia's imprisoned former Deputy Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. These letters, I mean, you're still in touch with Anwar? Yeah, I'm still in touch. Uh, a few ways, uh, through his lawyers. Mm. Yeah. I see. Is that Indeed, a... it's Gauss's commitment to Anwar Ibrahim that led him to Melbourne, where he's become the self-proclaimed frontman for the international Free Anwar campaign. Anwar stands for a just cause, right? Uh, he has, he made his sacrifices. And he was prepared to go in prison to stand for his principles. Just relax, relax. Take a speaker. Anwar Ibrahim was arrested in September 1998 and initially detained under the nation's Internal Security Act. The night before he was arrested, he spoke to me, he called me and he mentioned to me that uh, do not get caught, I can't afford you to get caught, do whatever it takes if things go wrong. So that's what he told me and that was where I made the decision to leave the country and to continue the campaign and the struggle to, to free Anwar. Rahim Gauss was granted a business visa to Australia three years ago. But in addition to campaigning for Anwar Ibrahim's release, Dateline has discovered that Gauss was also a director and a principal shareholder in a private company that has rung alarm bells in the US. One of his fellow directors has been named by authorities in America, Australia, the United Kingdom, Singapore and by the UN as a suspected terrorist. To find out how Rahim Gauss is connected to all of this, we must first of all take a closer look at the man he now champions, Anwar Ibrahim. I now challenge these spineless conspirators who are bold when oppressing the weak Yet, terrified of the wrath of the people, I challenge them now to do your worst. Bring me to court. Back in 1998, Anwar Ibrahim's arrest was considered nothing more than a power struggle between the ambitious deputy and the Prime Minister of 22 years, Dr Mahathir Mohamad. I mean, sure, there are a few thousand people following, following him, but the vast majority of 22 million people living in this country are quite happy as they are. Malaysia's Prime Minister raised allegations about his deputy's links to hardline Muslim fundamentalists, but in the lead up to his trial, this received little attention. There were far more sensational allegations to contend with. They have not only performed sodomy, but during the process, he was doing, uh, he was, uh, I don't know what you call it, he was masturbating this man. But Anwar's religious links have become a matter of great interest. Although Malaysia is a secular state, Islam's hold on society is strong. In the post-September 11 world, concern is now being raised about Malaysia and its place in the terrorist picture. I think, uh, especially after the September the 11th uh, terrorist attacks, uh, terrorism has become a concern not only uh, globally, but also in, uh, in countries where it, is, it seems to have uh, considerable uh, 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 networks and connections. And uh, Malaysia uh, features uh, uh, in this uh, international network. Yeah, I think that Malaysia is becoming a very important country in future funding for Islamist operations. Um, look, we know, for instance, that Hambali was associated with Malaysia. We know that a lot of Al-Qaeda leaders are coming now from Malaysia. Malaysia turned to be an easy place for Al-Qaeda to... Um, to fulfill their activities.
Rita Katz is one of America's foremost counter-terrorism experts. She is credited with going undercover to expose radical Islamic groups operating in the US. The executive director of the Site Institute, or Search for International Terrorist Entities, Katz does consultancy work for the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security and the Justice Department. Looks fine. Malaysia first came to her attention when the name of one high-profile public figure kept appearing as she attempted to unravel the tentacles of global terrorism. And that man was Malaysia's one-time Deputy Prime Minister. Anwar Ibrahim. Why? Because Anwar Ibrahim is associated with some of the organisations in the US that are subject of, of huge, huge investigation. One of those organisations is the International Institute of Islamic Thought. It's accused of funding the Islamic Jihad. The institute was directed by Taha al-Awani, an Iraqi who also founded the Muslim World League, another group whose assets were frozen by the US government because of its links to terror. In a raid last year on the charity's office, documents were uncovered which listed Malaysia's former Deputy Prime Minister as a one-time board member and contributor to the Institute's quarterly journal. More recently, as these documents show, his daughter, Nurul Iza, became the recipient of a substantial scholarship which would more than fund her university studies in Malaysia. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's news to me uh, completely. I never heard of it. But, uh, my immediate reaction is, is it true? Because uh, I would like to, to verify you know, so, such information. And if it is true, then of course it's just a matter of, it's, it's very serious. But the f fact is, is it true? Uh, and uh, unless uh, it can be verified, I think it's, it's not fair to make any comments. I do have the, the documents. I do have the uh, official records um, of that saying that. What does this say about the need for transparency? Well, I think absolutely. Uh, the, there's no doubt that the tentacles of uh, are, are, are global, worldwide, the multifarious, and uh, all the need for a very transparent approach to, to this problem. But I'm very interested to know if you can give me the after the event uh, all those effects. I'll let have a look at it, and uh, I will I will ask uh, Anwar or Aziza, you know, the truth of it. Malaysia's one-time heir apparent to Prime Minister Dr Mahathir is currently behind bars, convicted of misuse of power. He's not due for release until April 14, 2009, at the earliest. As American investigators delved into documents, their attention moved from Anwar Ibrahim to a Saudi businessman with extensive financial interests in Malaysia. We were never engaged in, uh, in helping any terrorist group. And this man, Sheikh Yassin al Qadi, came into their sights. And when I say the word or the name Yassin al Qadi, Sheikh Yassin al Qadi in the US, red lights are everywhere. People, people know that if his name is associated, then we're going to see some bad stuff there. He first came to FBI attention in the mid 1990s. Former FBI agent John Vincent headed up one of the earliest investigations into the Saudi businessman. At the time, Yassin al Qadi was accused of funding Palestinian militants through companies he established in the States. There was some money that came into the United States and we determined it came from Yassin Qadi. And that, that transfer took place in 1991, late 1991. And the money was then used as more or less seed money uh, to, to propel or uh, gain more money to be sent overseas. Evidence was gathered and links unraveled, showing funds from one of the Sheikh's companies directed to the hardline Palestinian organization Hamas in the Middle East. But no action was taken. It's terrorists. That's terrorists. This is terrorists. That all changed after September 11, 2001. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people... And the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. 
One month after America was shaken to the core by the most devastating terrorist attack on home soil, Yassin al Qadi was added to the United States list of designated terrorists. Rita Katt says it was for one reason. Because funding terrorism, you cannot be designated if you do not fund terrorism, if there is no evidence that you are funding terrorism. We know that one, uh, one uh, small detail that contributed to his designation was the fact that he funded Shafiq Kayadi. Shafiq Kayadi is one of Al-Qaeda members that was tied to the embassy bombing and other terrorist attacks. Um, he, he, he didn't deny the fact that he did give a check of, I think, $500,000 to Shafiq Kayadi. Other than that, um, his companies in the U.S. were uh, funding uh, Musa Abu Marzouk, who is the head of Hamas, and um, some other dirty activities that it's still very much under investigation. In Malaysia, the alarm bells were beginning to ring, for the sheikh was no stranger here. This house in the Malaysian capital, Kuala Lumpur, is where Sheikh Yassin al Qadi once called home. It's prime property in what's known as the capital's Golden Triangle. It was this address the Saudi businessman gave when he was granted permanent residency, or PR, by the Malaysian government, much to the amazement of those who knew who he was. Opposition leader Lim Kitsiang read about Sheikh Yassin al Qadi's business connections in Malaysia and wondered what Malaysia was doing to prevent terrorist activity fermenting on home soil. Oh yes, I was shocked. I think all Malaysians, as I said, the Malaysians read about the, all these uh, 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 terrorist links, uh, activities uh, affecting Malaysia from foreign publications, and uh, it is definitely shocking. And uh, 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 to Malaysians and to the people in the world, and uh, uh, it is something which we do not want to see. Sheikh Yassim al Qadi was given permanent residence of Malaysia. How easy is it for an outsider to get permanent residency here? For some people, it could be very easy, for some people, it could be very difficult. We have uh, Hambali, we have uh, all the various. Uh, 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 alleged to be kingpins of uh, uh, Jamaa Islamiyah uh, who are involved in the various uh, bombing blasts in uh, Indonesia. Um, many of them have uh, 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 PR and only in the case of Hambali, uh, who is supposed to be the right-hand man uh, or the Osama bin Laden of Asia, uh, his uh, permanent residence uh, status was only withdrawn after his arrest in uh, Ayutthaya, uh, uh, Thailand. I can't understand why the Malaysian will, will give Yassin al Qadi permanent residence after he was designated by the U.S. government, after they know that he was named with terrorism connections, after they know that he was named by the, gov by the U.S. government as bin Laden financier. I can't understand why they would do that, and especially that I think Malaysian government is very much aware of the fact that um, a lot of Islamists are using this country, Malaysia, to uh, fulfill their agenda, and they're trying to make it more radical. Investigators in the United States, both government and private, were now looking closely at Yassin al Qadi. As they sifted through a mountain of corporate, financial and banking documents, the reach of his financial tentacles began to emerge. The US government accused al Qadi of moving millions of dollars from Saudi sources. The US says some of that money, although how much remains unknown, ended up in the hands of terrorists, including Osama bin Laden. We're trying to uncover all his companies and to understand more about the, the way it operated because, for instance, one of the important companies that he established or he was a main investor is P-Tech, which is a computer company uh, that sells special databases and the clients are the U.S. government. It's the IRS, it's the FAA, it's the White House, it's the FBI, it's the State Department. However, at the same time, he's already named and designated as bin Laden's financier. Paytech is an American company and is not linked to companies in Australia of the same name.
Now, Dateline has uncovered a financial link between Saudi Sheikh Yassin Al Qadi's business network to none other than a certain Melbourne-based Malaysian businessman, Rahim Gauss. Both are principal shareholders and one-time directors in the same private company based in Kuala Lumpur, Abra International. The third director and the man who brought Al Qadi and Gauss together is another Malaysian businessman. One Hasni, one Salaiman. Stories of One Hasni's rags to riches success as a precocious student financial whiz are proudly displayed on Abra's web page. Abra's core business was touted as financial services, with the company applying the Islamic Sharia as its guiding beacon in promoting Islamic banking and finance. When one Hasni went looking for investors for Abra, he went to the Middle East. He says he met Sheikh Yassin Al-Qadi in 1993 or 94. Um, I've been running in and out of the Middle East um, since mid-1980s, yeah, uh, because I was then a student leader in the United States, and uh, so we happened to meet a lot of the Middle Eastern people. Uh, so um, in the 90s, uh, in 93 in particular when I started Abra and so on in Malaysia. So I went to Middle East a few times and uh, met many people there, all over the place in Kuwait, in the Emirates, in Oman, as well as Saudi Arabia. So in one of the trips to Saudi Arabia, one of my Saudi friends uh, introduced me to Mr. Yasin Kadi. I believe it was in late 93, if I'm not mistaken. If not, then must be in early 94. For him, maybe it was a small amount of money, yeah. so it doesn't seem that it's that hard for him to do so. And especially we are we are involved in um, in the area of uh, finance, and in particular the special focus on Islamic banking and finance. Yeah. A small amount of money. How much did he invest? Um, Twenty-four million ringgit, roughly about that. Yeah, so slightly less than ten million US at that time. Yeah, the exchange rate was uh, two point five ringgit per dollar. When you met him, what did you think of him? Well, um, he's a kind man. He, that's what I, my impression of him. Very soft, uh, very soft-spoken, uh, very polite, um, and a pleasant personality. One Husney was now in business, very big business. But he still needed another partner for the venture. Enter Rahim Gauss, the defender of the man once tipped to become Malaysia's next Prime Minister, Anwar Ibrahim. Gauss was a friend of Wan Hasni, such a good friend that Wan Hasni lent him some of the money he needed to become a principal shareholder. Rahim Gauss, he put part of the money, I uh, lent part of the money to him. Yeah. One Husni was by far the biggest shareholder, owning more than 50% of the total stock in Abra International. Between them, Rahim Gauss and Yassin Al Qadi took up the rest of the shares. No, 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 no. For his part, Rahim Gauss does not deny his business dealings with a man accused of funding terrorism and whose assets have been frozen by government decree in the United States and the UK. Abra International, mm -hmm. your partners in that. Mm -hmm. uh, one, Dr. Wan Hasni, one yeah. Suleiman, mm -hmm. Sheikh Yassin Al Qadi. Mm -hmm. Do you know these men well? Yeah, I know them. Yeah, I know them. How would you describe them? As uh, close they, friends? Yeah, they are businessmen. Yeah, they are involved in business. They are heavily involved in business. They're close associates of yours? Yeah, they are, Dr. Wan is a close associate with me. Uh, Yasin, I met him in Malaysia in 1960, I'm sorry, 1995 or 1996, yeah, when he wanted to make some form of investments in Malaysia. He's now on mm -hmm. the US and the UK on the wanted list mm -hmm. as, a, as someone with, mm -hmm. who has funded Osama bin Laden, yeah. who has terrorist links. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it, your dealings with him, do you still have dealings with him? No, at the moment I don't have any more dealings with him. Uh, since I left the country in 1998, uh, I left all these matters to Dr. Wan Hasni. 
on all the matters of Abraham, so I don't have any more dealings with him. When did you last speak with him? Oh, years ago. I couldn't remember. It should be a number of years ago. Juan Hasni also says so communication I'll, I'll between he and the Sheikh has ended. Have you spoken to Sheikh Yassim al Qadi about the accusations made against him? When, have, when did you last speak uh, with him? I have not been in communication with him, speaking to him or whatever, um, since uh, 1998. Why not? Well, we had a big quarrel uh, in 1998 after the, current, the economic crisis and the company went into crisis then. And uh, so after that, we had a big quarrel, I mean, big, dis big, dis big disagreements. Uh, so after that, then uh, I walked my way, he walked his way, and we never really communicate. Yeah? Of course, his accountant do came here, check the companies and whatever, and go back to report to him. Yeah. But you've not spoken to him no, since then? No. And after the annou announcement of September 11 issues and whatever, also I never spoken to him. While both men say they have not spoken directly to the Saudi Sheikh for some years, it was in April this year that Juan Hasni resigned as a director of Abra International. Rahim Gauss has also resigned, although it appears he failed to notify Malaysia's Registrar of Companies, as is required by law. But both men remain Abra International's principal shareholders. As mere shareholders, their responsibility for their company's activities has diminished. Authorities in the United States are no longer interested in justice in Al Qadi. Dateline has learnt that they are now looking at his associates and the companies in which they invested. Abra's business dealings with Global Chemicals America, a household chemical producer, is just one example of why authorities are keen to pursue these financial trials. As this 1997 FBI application for a search warrant details, Global Chemicals was suspected of fraud and money laundering. The Chicago Fire Department wanted to know why the company was stockpiling dangerous chemicals. One of the company's directors has since been jailed after being found guilty of money laundering. The company is no longer trading. Rita Katz believes Juan Hasni should well be nervous. He's a person of concern. To me, very much. Why? I don't think that Sheikh Yassin al qadi would have worked with people who he doesn't trust. Juan Hasni agreed to be interviewed by Dateline in Kuala Lumpur, but he brought along backup. You um, have brought your associates with you and you've recorded this whole interview. Yeah. Why? Well, uh, I want to have also this interview on my record and uh, I want to keep it for my personal thing. And You're nervous? Uh, no, not nervous. Never nervous. That's, the, that, that's not really the work of a non-nervous man. <laughs> well, I don't know you. I don't know the SBS. I don't know what Australia is, as I told you. Uh, I don't know what's your agenda. Uh, yeah. So as well as I think anybody who don't know what other people's intention are, then you just want to be safe. Sheikh Yassin al Qadi has tried without success to remove his name from the UN suspected terrorist list and to unfreeze his funds. Singapore is the most recent nation to label the Saudi businessman a terrorist. While under the UN resolution, it is an offence to have any business or financial dealings with any one or any organisation on that list, Australian authorities would not confirm or deny whether they were investigating either of his Malaysian business partners.